Please welcome with me back to PCC, Pastor Brian Bueller. Thank you, John. Ah, uh, so good to see you. I'm smiling at you. I can't see you smiling back, but if you're smiling, just put up, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I see that hand. Uh, thank you, John, for being so gracious to me. John and I have known each other for many years, long before the church started to court him. And um, I'm so grateful that the Lord called him and now has rounded out the staff with these two new staff people. This is very exciting. Uh, Craig Hanke met me at the back as soon as I walked in and he said, Brian, you look so much lighter. And he didn't mean, you know, my, my physical weight. He meant the, the pressure on me. And John happened to be standing right beside me and I said, that's because all my weight has landed on him. <laughs> so thanks for bearing the weight, John. Thank you. Well, why put my hope in God? Won't he just let me down? And if you have your Bibles, I'd like you to turn to two texts, one in the Old Testament, Isaiah 50, and one in the New Testament, Mark chapter 8, Isaiah 50, and Mark 8. But before we launch into the text, uh, we will pray, and then I want to kind of set the stage as to why these two questions are so relevant today. Oh, Lord, it's so beautiful to be back. Thank you for this special group of people that have blessed Myrna and me in so many ways. And today, Lord, there is a task at hand, and that's to look at this challenging subject. So we pray, Holy Spirit, for your anointing on me and upon all of us. May, at the end of the message, Jesus be even more clear and real. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well... The subject before us couldn't be more relevant, and especially for teenagers and young adults, and it's really that group of people, that demographic that I feel the most concerned about today. Being disappointed with God is actually a very natural, necessary step in a person's spiritual formation. If you hit the age of 25 or 30 and you say, you, it's never even crossed your mind that you would ever be disappointed in God, I would think that maybe you were stunted emotionally or spiritually because all the great saints cried out in God about their disappointment with him at one time or another. It's natural. Of course, hiding behind these two questions is the sticky subject of suffering and evil. John alluded to that when he talked about how difficult this subject is. It's what theologians call theodicy. And though we won't even begin to solve the riddle of you know, how evil entered into the universe or why God allowed evil to be in the universe, doing that would make us as foolish as Job's friends. Though we won't even begin to talk about that, there is a nagging question that every one of us asks at least one time in our life, and that is, if God is love, and if God is all-powerful, then why doesn't he do something about the rampant evil that's in the world? Or if God uh, delights in um, working in the midst of suffering and relieving people's suffering, as we know he does, why doesn't he do it now in a wholesale kind of way? Or more personally, in keeping with the theme today, if I commit my whole life to God, if I stake everything on him, and then my whole world unravels, has it been worth it? Why not just be a non-Christian? They at least don't have all the, or the moral obligations of being a Christian. I can at least live free without feeling guilty. Well, though these questions have been asked by people of every generation, they find unique relevance in our current cultural climate with the result that many young people, more now than in previous generations, are deconstructing in their faith, meaning that the pillars that were upholding their Christian faith are crumbling and they are becoming disillusioned with Christianity at large, large numbers. 
And though there are so many reasons for this trend towards deconstruction, the issue before us today is right at the top. Uh, I have met so many, uh, even people my age or a little younger, who used to be in full-time ministry. They gave decades of their life to serving God, and because something very difficult had happened in their life through their church towards them, now they say, I don't even know if I believe in God at all. So there's a case of pastors experiencing deconstruction because they don't know what to do with the subject of suffering. Now, as our kids know, and all of us who have kids know, we are being bombarded every day through every kind of media with a worldview that idolizes personal happiness, individual freedom, and self-expression as the ultimate meaning and goal in life. To be alive today and to be a young person means that if you're going to be at all authentic, you need to be true to who you have determined yourself to be. In his book, The Rise and Triumph of the Modern Self, Carl Truman has traced what has brought us to this current place in Western culture, where the meaning of life no longer is found outside of ourselves in what we would call the transcendent, or even the general sense of orthodoxy that there is objective goodness, truth, and beauty. No, we don't look there anymore for meaning. We are told and taught in our universities to look inside ourselves. And so we no longer find meaning out here. We are the creators of our own meaning. Charles Taylor, a Christian philosopher, has called this expressive individualism. And a very bright pastor from Australia, Mark Sayers, has said this about it. The primary social ethic of our culture is tolerance of everyone's self-defined quest for individual freedom and self-expression. Any deviation from this ethic of tolerance is considered dangerous and must not be tolerated. So in case you, that's just abstract to you and you don't, you know, you're not jiving with this, let me illustrate. If I am a current product of this culture and there's no other worldview that has shaped me, that means that if I wake up this morning and my primary psychological feeling is grumpiness and I have felt grumpy for a number of months, I am being told by my culture to self-identify as grumpy. And because my own therapeutic happiness is my final state of authority, if I come to church acting out my grumpiness, which of course we are taught to do, and you push back even a little bit, or you poke the bear, or you suggest to me that maybe good-naturedness would be better than grumpiness, then I have every right given to me by the culture to call you the oppressor and me the oppressed. And the only thing left for me to do is to either cancel you because you disagree with my grumpiness or find a whole lot of other psychologically grumpy people and band together and mount an all-out cultural revolution. And that is what is happening right now in our world. And you see it in almost every commercial. You see it on TV. You see it online. You see it in, on Facebook. This is the world Christians who have a transcendent worldview are living in. Now, this is why nobody was surprised when two weeks ago, when Oprah asked Adele after her new album came out, Adele, tell us, what do you really desire for your son? And she said, I just want him to be happy. Of course, Adele like all of us, are products of our culture where therapeutic happiness is the supreme ideal. Here's the funny thing about it. It's ironic that, that with this unchallenged quest for psychological happiness, the exact opposite has happened in our youth culture. An epidemic of depression, anxiety, and teenage suicide going through the roof. So apparently, psychological happiness and self-expression is not accomplishing what we are hoping that it's doing. And so we haven't even gotten to the Bible yet. 
but I wanted to create the tension in this room as to why it's so difficult for this particular generation in the West to not be disappointed in God. To answer the question, should I put my hope in God? Won't I just be disappointed? <laughs> the answer is yes. You will be disappointed every time unless your will and spirit is aligned with God's. Then you won't be disappointed. You'll understand what he's doing in the world. But if your commitment to therapeutic happiness and self-expression and you creating for yourself your own identity runs at cross purposes to God's desire for you, you will only be disappointed in God and Christianity will not work for you. But conversely, if we begin to see God's true character, if we begin to experience his love, if we familiarize ourselves with his story of redemption and how we fit into that story, we will find that our desires begin to find alignment with God's desires. And in the words of Paul, the hope we experience will not disappoint. But before we get there, we have to talk about the elephant in the room. As we begin to read through the Bible, there's this theme that emerges early on in, in the book of Genesis. And the theme, like a snowball, rolling down a hill, gaining size and speed, climaxes in the person of Jesus Christ on the cross. Then the theme continues on through his people, through the church, until the end of the book of Revelation, where the theme comes to an abrupt end, and we no longer see the theme ever again throughout eternity. That theme is suffering. And notwithstanding the general kind of suffering that everybody in the world has always experienced as a result of our rebellion against God, I'm talking about the specific suffering that came as a result of God's judgments on us in Genesis 3, God's judgment upon Adam, his judgment upon Eve, his judgment upon the serpent, and his judgment upon creation itself, upon the earth, you know, the thorns and thistles part, notwithstanding the general kind of suffering that we are seeing happen happening right now in light of a pandemic, there's a unique suffering that accompanies anyone who is called by God to fulfill a divine task in the world. Anyone summoned by God to partner with him in advancing his kingdom and bearing his word, his truth, in the world will suffer uniquely on top of the general kind of suffering that we all experience. And so we see this as we read through the Bible. There are no exceptions. Everyone who says yes to God, I'll be your woman, I'll be your man, I'll speak on your behalf in whatever field you've called me to, will suffer. Abraham, Sarah, Moses, David, Jeremiah, Bill prayed about many of these people. Daniel, Mary, the mother of Jesus, Peter, John the Baptist, Paul, Stephen, the list goes on, it's endless. And the writer to the Hebrews describes the kind of suffering they experienced like this. There were others who were tortured, refusing to be released. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. They wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. And here's the key. They were all commended for their faith. These people all had hope in God. And they all suffered. Which raises a huge question. Why is it that people who say yes to God, who say, I will speak your truth, I will live your truth in this world, are so hated and mistreated throughout history? And is not the answer? It's because the world in which we live in, which is in the grip of the evil one, is a very inhospitable place for the word of God. 
The Word of God is not welcome in so many places and in so many lives. And this is why when Jesus came preaching, he talked about this a lot. He said, this, the sower comes and sows the seed of the Word. And no sooner does it hit the, the rocky ground and the birds are there to devour it. Satan says, get that seed out of here. And then Jesus said, but if the seed does land on good soil and takes root and the kingdom starts to grow, just know that the devil will plant his seed right beside it so the wheat and the tare will grow up side by side and will not be removed until judgment day. When Jesus, who is the eternal word of God, was publicly acknowledged as such at his baptism where the father said, you are my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. And everybody now knew it and the spirit descended upon him and he began to speak the word to the world. It says that all the powers of hell were unleashed on him to derail him from his mission. And what did Jesus do with the enemy? Continued to speak the word. It is written. Which leads us now to just the most beautiful text. Isaiah 50, verses 4 and 5. The sovereign Lord has given me an instructed tongue to know the word that sustains the weary. He wakens me morning by morning, wakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears and I've not been rebellious. I have not drawn back beautiful. I, I want to be a person just like this. And I'm sure you do too. That's why you're here. And at this point, we don't exactly know who this person is because he has not been named. We know he is male. He hasn't been identified, but one thing is clear. He really loves God and God loves him. It sounds like a New Testament disciple of Jesus. It sounds like a Christian. This sounds like you. It sounds like us. It sounds like Mary, the mother of Jesus, who said, I am the Lord's bondservant. May it be to me as you have said. Yes, I will bear your word, quite literally, to the world. This person in Isaiah 50 is woken up morning by morning by God, it says, with a mission. And the mission is simple. Hear God's word, receive it with joy, speak it to others. Who are the others? It says, the weary who need to be sustained by the word. So this is mothers and fathers speaking to their children. It's teachers speaking to their students. It's pastors and disciplers. It's business people who speak the truth to employees. This is all of us who bear the word. And I love verse 5. The sovereign Lord has opened my ears. I've not been rebellious. I have not drawn back. Well, beautiful. Now, one would think that a person of such spiritual earnestness and commitment to God would be rewarded by God with a life with as little suffering as possible. <laughs> like a spiritual karma. You know, I work for God, he's got my back. I speak for God, he makes sure no bad things happen to me. That kind of thing. And that actually sounds like a reasonable trade-off for most people and certainly for most religions. Until we read verse 6. This is the same guy. I offered my back to those who beat me. My cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not hide my face from mocking and spitting. What? This seems to be coming out from left field. Can it be true that a woman who offers her life to God, to God's service naturally offers her back for beating? I'm not saying it's right. Is it true that if Mary offers her womb to the living word, it goes without saying, as the angel said, just know that a sword will pierce your heart because you're saying yes? Is it true that a man who offers his mouth to God for speaking, though he's not good at speaking and he stutters and he's really quite shy, that if he offers his voice to God the best he can, that he naturally then offers his face for spitting and pulling out his beard and mocking? Is suffering really this inevitable for the Christian? As we've been reading this from Isaiah's prophecy, I have to ask you, beloved, 
Does this person being described here remind you of anybody in the, in the New Testament? Someone who offered his face for spitting and his beard for being pulled out? Time for Mark chapter 8, beginning in verse 31. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed, and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, but Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me in the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man or a woman to gain the whole world and lose, forfeit his own soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is one of the difficult sayings of Jesus. But now we know something for sure. We know who the suffering servant of Isaiah 50 is. This is the fulfillment. They're talking about Jesus, and the disciples are not impressed at all. They want a theology of triumph, what they get from Jesus is a theology of the cross. Or you could put it another way, in light of our sermon title, the disciples had put all of their hope in Jesus. Now, they were very disappointed. In fact, Peter was still under the impression that to be identified with Jesus, to be his follower, was to finally be exempt from suffering, and maybe even death. But Jesus could not have been more clear. Anyone who chooses to follow him bearing his gospel to the world, will inevitably suffer loss in this life, yet be rewarded in the next. In other words, you cannot have your best life now. Even if a preacher in Texas is telling you you can. The self-denial that characterizes Christian discipleship sounds very different than the expressive individualism and self-identification of our culture. The idea that parents simply want their children to be happy at all costs flies in the face of everything that Jesus stands for. So when our teens and young adults get baptized, they need to be catechized first to understand that by saying yes to Jesus, they are spitting on the devil, which is what they do in the Eastern Orthodox tradition. They are turning their back on the world, the flesh, and the devil. They are dying to this idea that their therapeutic happiness is the most important thing. They are being raised up with Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit to follow him all the way to death, suffering and death. And yet in doing so, a life of real joy is experienced and real meaning. But it's not through the removal of suffering but the experiencing of it. Only those who lose their lives for Jesus' sake will discover their lives. So the common slogan, you can be anything you want to be, which is now so ubiquitous that nobody is challenging it, it is simply a blatant counter-narrative to the way of Jesus, and we should not tell our kids that. Back to our question. Should I put my hope in God? Won't he just disappoint me? It all depends. <laughs> in whether we are willing to give up the few paltry pearls that we have in our hand, the paltry pearls of complete sexual freedom, of self-definition, of expressive individualism, of therapeutic happiness, if we're willing to give these away for the pearl of great price, we will not be disappointed. But as long as we're clinging to these, we will be disappointed every time because you can't have both. You liquidate your few pearls and you get Jesus. 
So is there a price? Is there a cost in becoming a Christian? Yes, there is. Of course, we know that Jesus paid the full price for our salvation when he died on the cross. He did something none of us could do. But the price that we pay, the price that you pay, is the cost of exchanging your life for his. There might be some of you here today who are hearing this, and you're concluding that, well, I guess becoming a Christian will be postponed indefinitely. And that's very fair. You should not become a Christian. Becoming a Christian involves counting the cost of what you lose and what you gain. Jesus said, if a man sets out to build a tower but doesn't count the cost first as to what it's going to take and how much it's going to cost, he should not have started building the tower. However, before you make a final decision as to whether you really want to become a Christian or not, you owe it to yourself to hear the end of the sermon and the rest of the story because we've only heard the really hard part. Back to our text. Look at Isaiah 50, verse 7. Once again, this is the same guy. This is Jesus. Because the sovereign Lord helps me, I will not be disgraced. Therefore, I've set my face like a flint. In other words, I'm more determined than ever than living out my mission. And I know I will not be put to shame. He who vindicates me is near So the suffering has a redemptive purpose. It's not meaningless. The suffering servant is also not alone. He is helped in his suffering. And he is vindicated. So how did God the Father vindicate Jesus? Well, we know the answer to that. We've we've heard this so many times. The Father accepted the Lord's sacrifice for sins, thus vindicating him. He received the voluntary suffering of Jesus as the Lord's act of worship to his Father. He raised him from the dead. He exalted him above every principality and power. He gave him the name above every name. Yes, the shame that Jesus experienced while suffering on the cross with us and for us was temporary, which raises the question, if suffering in this life is our God-ordained lot. And in order to live in union with Jesus, we must live in union with the fellowship of his sufferings. Then what can I count on God for? And I'm really glad you asked that question. Three things. And with this, the landing gear is out. The plane will be landed shortly. We have his presence. What really matters more? Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And the God who is with us is not some impersonal deism-type God that does not understand us. No, he understands because he is the suffering God. He understands suffering. He has suffered And I'm really not sure, beloved, why God allowed evil to enter into the universe. It's way beyond me and it's way beyond us. But this I do know by reading the Bible. Whatever bitter pill God has required me to swallow, he has taken his own medicine in Jesus. Jesus walks with us in our pain. And though Mary and Martha don't get every prayer answered and their beloved brother Lazarus dies and Jesus lets him die, what Mary and Martha do get is the presence of Jesus embracing them and weeping with them at the tomb of Lazarus. And they also get the God who says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. So in answer to the question, young people, look, if I, if I really become a Christian, won't God just disappoint me? And I, I just don't want any of this to be unclear before you leave here today. Psalm 46 is very helpful. Here's what King David tells us will happen <laughs> 
If we become a follower of Yahweh, he says, the earth beneath our feet will give way. The mountains will fall into the sea. The waters will roar and foam. The mountains will quake with their surging. The nations will be in an uproar. Kingdoms will fall. The earth will melt. And desolations will be brought upon the earth. So in answer to the question, can't I trust God and hope in him that none of these desolations will ever come near me? No, you can't. Because these desolations have been promised. Jesus said through many trials and tribulations, we shall enter the kingdom of God. It doesn't mean that God is not our protector, our shield and defender, and that if he were to take his protection away, we'd probably all be dead. He protects us nonstop, but he does not protect us from everything. So what can I take to the bank? Verse 1 of Psalm 46, that God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Or the last verse of Psalm 46, the Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. I know I've told you this story so many times, but a few of you are new. Quite a few, actually. And it's so good to see. When Myrna and I had our first baby, he was born... Uh, at the Grace Hospital in Calgary, seven pounds, seven ounces. His name was Titus. And they, the nurse wrapped him up in a blanket and carried him to Myrna. And she held Titus for the first time after her cesarean section. But Titus was dead. He had not made it through the birth canal alive. And our hearts were broken. We had prayed for a living baby, but we didn't get one. We had prayed for a healthy baby, but we didn't get one. And we went home with empty arms and with a vacant nursery. And yet somebody sent us a note during that incredibly painful, confusing time. And what it said is, dear Brian and Myrna, for this we have Jesus We might not have had our son, but we had the Lord. And the Lord really was with us. And because he is a Lord who has suffered like we have suffered, we were able to receive his special comfort, his presence. You can take that to the bank every time. Secondly, his providence. What does it mean, the providence of God? It means that within the apparent chaos and randomness and meaninglessness of life and of the way in which we all suffer, God's invisible hand is at work in it all, bringing about his perfect plan in our lives. That's what it means. So though the events that happen to us, for example, the abuse, is not good, nothing about it is good, God makes it work for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose, that they might be conformed into the image of his son. Providence. C.S. Lewis helped us understand providence by saying that our life is like a straight line on a page with Uh, The birth at the beginning and the death at the end. And there it is. There is our life. We all have one. We all have a timeline. And along the timeline, said Lewis, was all these X's that represent all the suffering and the loss and the grief and the disappointment of our life. And he said, while those things are happening, we wonder where God is in all of this. But only as we stand back and look at the past are we able to see that our timeline has been intersected with all kinds of other lines which all represent the invisible hand of God, bringing blessing and healing and actually hearing prayers and answering prayers, God bringing people and churches into our life at a time when we desperately needed it. This is providence The the guy who best illustrates this perhaps is Joseph in the Old Testament and his unique timeline of countless disappointments. A dysfunctional family, brothers who hated him, who sold him as a slave. And then he ends up in Egypt and they malign him and falsely accuse him and imprison him and they simply forget about him. And it's just a horrible 20 years. 
Where are you, God, in all of this? But at the end of the story, as he identifies himself with his brothers and he forgives them, one of the greatest lines right in Genesis, he says, you meant all this for evil. God meant it for good. That's providence. And I think the most powerful illustration of providence is the cross. Because in the event of the cross, the most horrendous evil ever experienced by anyone was used by God to bring about the greatest good. And finally, the plane has almost landed. We have the Lord's perspective. In the words of the Negro spiritual, soon I will be done with the troubles of the world. I'm going to live with God. No more weeping and wailing. I'm going to live with God. I'm going to see my mother. I'm going to live with God. No more weeping and wailing. I'm going to live with God. Beloved church, PCC, we are different than other people. We are Christians. We have an eschatological worldview, which means we don't think that all of life is lived here and now for our therapeutic happiness. We look to the finish line. We look to the end. That's where our eyes are riveted on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. This is what true Christian hope is. You know, the title If I put my hope in God, won't I be disappointed? Well, are you hoping that if you pray for good weather on your wedding day, is that what hope is? Or are you praying that you meet the person of your dreams and they fulfill all of your deepest emotional needs? Is that what hope is for you? Does hope mean that you will get the job of your dreams and you will become wealthy and own a home here in the lower mainland? Is that what you're hoping for? God to provide for you, and none of those things are bad. Don't misunderstand me. But that's not Christian hope. Christian hope is called the blessed hope, and it's always connected to the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ when he comes again to judge the living and the dead and make all the wrongs of the world right. This is what it means to hope. And so we can say that the suffering of this present time is not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. For when he comes, then every tear will be wiped away from our eyes. And there'll be no more pain and suffering and death, for the former things will pass away. So during the Nazi invasion of Europe, there was a Christian family in Holland that committed to protecting Jews who were being hunted down like animals and sent to Auschwitz to be incinerated. Corrie Ten Boom and her sister Betsy actually hid Jewish people in their home. Of course, all of this was written in a best-selling book entitled The Hiding Place. Everything changed for the two women and their dad when a fellow Dutchman blew the whistle on their clandestine mission and the father died within 10 days of being arrested and the two sisters were incarcerated in Ravensbrück, a concentration camp for women. And there, the conditions were just horrendous. We could not mention them in a sermon. And it was there in a large, dark, flea-infested cell under a single light bulb that hundreds of women from many nations jammed into this cell stood around the two sisters as they led in worship services and read the Bible out loud that was being translated into many languages, a Bible that Betsy had smuggled into the camp in her backpack. Now physically weakened, By the inhumane conditions, Betsy died, yet Corey was released after V-Day. When Ravensbrook was raided and liberated, a note was found on the body of a dead teenager. It read as follows, O Lord, remember not only the men and women of goodwill, but also those of ill will. Do not remember all the suffering that they have inflicted on us, Remember the fruits that we have borne thanks to this suffering. 
our comradeship, our loyalty, our humility, our courage, our generosity, the greatness of heart which has grown out of all of this. And when they, the Nazis, come to judgment, let all the fruits that we have borne be their forgiveness. Corey went on to travel the world telling her story of how they experienced Christ in Ravensbrück. And perhaps one of her most notable quotes is this one. Let's look at the next slide. You can never learn that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. Brothers and sisters, should you put your hope in God? Won't you just be disappointed? It all depends. It depends on whether you choose Jesus or some other path to ultimate meaning and happiness. In Christ, there is real life even in a concentration camp. Thanks be to God for his amazing gift. Let's pray. First of all, dear friend, with your head bowed, thinking about what maybe the Holy Spirit is doing in your heart right now, if you are being summoned by Jesus Christ to follow him and to give up everything. And you can simply pray a prayer like, that sounds like this. Lord Jesus, I've been living my life independently of you. I know who you are, but you are not my Lord. And I repent. And I trust in what you have done for me on the cross, that when you died, you forgave all my sins and that you were raised from the dead as my Lord and as my friend. And I submit my life to you now. Forgive my sins. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. And from this day forward, I choose to follow you no matter what comes my way. And for the majority of us, we are well along the path, aren't we? We've been Christians, most of us, for a long time. Oh, Holy Spirit, take this message and burn it into our hearts, lest we forget what we can expect from you in this life and what we cannot expect. And keep our focus riveted to the second coming, which on the first day of Advent we now celebrate in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after giving thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you, Eat this in remembrance of me. Yes, you can begin to take out your communion packet. And then after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this as often as you will in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So someday, this meal will be replaced with the marriage supper of the Lamb. Until then, let's let this meal nourish us for the fight of faith we're all in. Let's eat and drink together. <laughs>